the truth, and nothing but the truth. This is GBN, the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Amen, we shall rise on that resurrection morning when death's prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Hello and welcome again to Counterpoint. I'm Mike Hickson and as always, I have with me B.J. Clark. B.J., it's always so good to be with you. It's good to be with you, Mike. B.J., today we want to talk about some dangerous trends in America. And you and I, of course, were products of the 60s and 70s, and quite frankly, this is a changed country. Mm -hmm. And so many trends have come and gone, and we talk about some of the dramatic, drastic changes that have taken place in our country, one of which would be in the moral realm. H how do we... How do we counter a culture that has moved in many respects away from the ideals of Scripture and uh, a country that at one time may have been God-centered that is now self-centered? How do we counter that? Right. Well, fortunately and unfortunately at the same time, we have some examples in Scripture of folks and nations that went astray and how they were prescribed to fix that. And you know, one thing that's interesting, Mike, is that in America it's not like no one did any immoral things until recently in the recent years or decades. Uh, the difference is back then you had to jump over the fence to get to the pasture to do the things that you shouldn't be doing. Today the fences are down. That's right. And all the barriers that uh, used to restrain people uh, are gone, and uh, in their minds at least. They're mm -hmm. not gone altogether. The Bible is still here. That's right. And it has the same exact advice today for good living that it had in the 1930s, the 1940s, 50s, etc. And so really, you, you mentioned a moment ago, Mike, moving away from the ideals of Scripture, mm -hmm. and that's really the way back, is to move back to what this book says it's the truth that makes men free, John 8, mm -hmm. 32. And nations that forget God are destined for destruction, Psalm 9 and verse 17. Right. And so how do you know God? Well, you don't look up into the heavens and wait for some conversation with Him, uh, physical. You go to His revelation and sure. you find out who He is and what He wants you and me to be. Well, I think so. And B.J., when you mentioned the Psalms just a moment ago, I was thinking about what the psalmist said many years ago. He said, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And I know that there are still a lot of good people in our country. And there are many, many people that look at the downward trends morally, spiritually in our country. And, and, and they ask the question legitimately, what, what can we do? And, and so in light of how do we counter that, as a child of God, what can we do? Right. The, the only way we can hang on as members of the church and children of God is to anchor ourselves to Christ and His Word. You know, uh, Jesus told His apostles to do something very difficult in one sense, and that's to go to all the world and preach the gospel. He knew, He even warned them that the, the people would think they were doing God a service sure. when they persecuted them or killed them. Mm -hmm. But He said something to them that is still true today. Uh, he, in principle for sure. He said, Lo, I am with you always. He sent them out with a commission, right. but also with a promise, I am with you. I will be with you to help you through this always. And so knowing that helps me when I look around and I feel like we're surrounded. I think back to Second Kings chapter 6 and the, the individual that looked out with the prophet there and saw the mass uh, the massive array of assemblage against them. And he said, fear not, they that be with us are more than they that be with them, is what the prophet told him. That's right. And so you and I need to realize that if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? Romans that's 8, 31. There's the encouragement that we need. Well, that's right. And in, in light of that, to know, to know that, as you said a moment ago, the Lord will be with us. You know, when Joshua assumed the mantle of leadership after Moses had died in Joshua chapter 1, the Lord said, 
that he would be with him mm -hmm. wherever he went. Right. And so to know that whatever we do in his name, he'll be with us. BJ, one of the things that I came across the other day, I was doing some research for an article that I was writing, and I came across a statistic that really startled me. It said that over the past five decades, there has been a 900% increase in cohabitation among couples who are not married in our country. That's startling. And, and so how do we reverse or how do we counter a culture that in many respects has the idea that living together uh, is the better alternative mm -hmm. than marriage? There's no way to do it unless we get them first to believe that this book has the right to determine whether they should or shouldn't be doing it. Uh, think about it. How many of those folks who are in that 900 percent increase said, well, you know what, we've investigated the Bible from cover to cover, and what we've learned is that living together is no big deal to God. How many of them could actually say that or do that? None of them could say that. If they'd actually investigated this book, what would they have found? Well, among other things, they would have found this, Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed, that's the marriage bed, mm -hmm. is undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Mm -hmm. And so here's a passage of Scripture that's very plain sure. and to the point, and it says that marriage is God's plan. We don't have to read very far into Scripture to find that out. The book of Genesis shows us that God brought the woman and gave her to the man, and then this editorial comment from Moses, inspired comment, he says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, mm -hmm. and they too shall be one flesh. What God has joined together, Jesus would later say, let not man put asunder. Right. People today want to join themselves together without regard to whether God's in, involved in the equation. And the Bible is the antidote to all of this, Mike. We've got to get people to go back and make their decisions based on what this book says. I agree. You know, one of the things that I came across, and this is, of course, looking at it from a generic, general standpoint, but they were talking about, quote, unquote, people that identify with Christianity, particularly among young people, that many of those people do not see uh, the dangers of living together. As a matter of fact, they, they believe that it's, it's quite acceptable. Right. Uh, you know, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, when Paul talked about the younger women, he said his will was that they would marry and then bear children, and in many cases we've got the cart before the horse. Because how many, how many people are having children now out of wedlock? And so we've got to reverse that trend, and again, you know, how do we counter that? How many times have we heard people say, well, marriage is just a piece of paper? Well, reality says that marriage is God's plan, it's God's design, right. and He never reduced it to the idea of being just a piece of paper. No, marriage is not just a piece of paper. Marriage is obeying God's way of doing things. Right. Now, someone says, I don't like that. How many times have we said on this program, Mike, if people don't like the way this universe has been arranged and the rules that have been given to govern it, mm -hmm. if they don't like that, that's right. They can go out and make a universe of their own and run it the way they want to. But wait a minute. They can't <laughs> do that. That's right. And so since they cannot make a universe, maybe they're not as smart and powerful as they think they are, and maybe they ought to bow to the one who already did make a universe, right. and it's his universe, his rules, his rules for marriage. And as long as this book exists and it is a revelation from God and it can be proven that it is, its extraordinary content shows it's beyond human production alone. This book right here is divinely sent for the very purpose of countering human thinking. You know, you just triggered a thought in my mind. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16, Paul said, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then he said, And is profitable. Right. B.J., how many people in our world today, if you were in, in our country too, if you were to ask them, Do you see the profitability of opening this book and, and reading its content, saturating your mind with it, they'd say, you know what, I've never thought about that. B, B.J., is it a fair question to ask in light of the fact that in many ways we've abdicated the will of God and the Word of God in our lives in this country, is it a fair question to ask, how's it working out for us? Uh, yeah, but I, when I grew up, I went to elementary school in Memphis, Tennessee, and I actually had a teacher, it was not a religious school, mind you, I actually had a teacher that would read a small section from the Bible to us every day. And then one day it didn't happen. 
And the next day, it didn't happen. And the next day, it didn't happen. And I said, we suddenly realized. I even asked my teacher about it and was informed that this was no longer allowed. Okay, she wasn't commenting on the Bible. I was just a small elementary student, but it made an impression on me. And I thought to myself, wow. And you wonder why we're having all these school shootings and all these school you know, uh, crimes that are committed. Right. And it's not hard to figure out that when we get away from that which civilizes a society, That's right. then we're not going to be shocked to see that uh, our society becomes uncivilized. I think in light of what you just said, Romans chapter 1 comes to mind. Paul oh, exactly. there pictures the Gentile world and the fact that yeah. they had refused to retain God in their knowledge. And so what, what it says to me is that when civilizations, when people choose to abdicate the will of God, revelation in their lives, then they're headed for trouble. And, and Romans chapter 1 is, is really a picture of people out of control. In fact, you can't read Romans chapter 1, Mike, without almost thinking that you're watching the evening news. That's right. Uh, being filled with all unrighteousness, verse 29 says, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder. He mentions uh, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. How much have we seen that? No. More aggressive. Atheism's more militant and aggressive than it's ever, ever been, been in recent years in our culture. It mentions uh, those who invent evil things, disobedient to parents, uh, people that break their covenants, uh, they don't stay together, without natural affection. There's your uh, abortion mentality that uh, a mother's normal affection is for her child, not to destroy her child. Right. But we've grown up in a society where this has become so much the norm in the way that it's presented in the mainstream media and television shows right. that anyone that stands up against it is viewed as some kind of ignoramus. That's right. How sad. Really is, really is. And you know in Romans chapter 1 you mentioned a moment ago the fact that it's really as if we're reading the daily paper and without natural affection. Look, look at the home today. How many times have we said, as the home goes, so goes the nation? Well, really, so as the home goes, so goes the church, too. Sure. So when the home is in disarray and not functioning as a God-ordained unit, as God intended, then obviously there are going to be problems. And, and so really the cornerstone, the foundation of, of a nation is the, is the family, the home. So, so, B.J., how do we counter this trend in, in which people look at marriage as uh, something that they can just dispense with. I, I was talking to a lady uh, the other day at services and she lives down the street from a very famous entertainer. And she said that uh, his wife drives a, an automobile and her license tag reads eight. And that signifies it's his, she is his eighth wife. Yeah. So, so, you know, we're living in a day and time when, when people don't even know the basics. If we could get people to slow down, Mike, and really contrast and compare. You mentioned it earlier. How's that working for you? Well, if you look at these folks who are celebrities and the lifestyles that they're living, you see them on television all the time. It's the same story. They started out with next to nothing. They became rich and famous and looked like they had everything. But then something was missing, so they started turning to drugs, mm -hmm. alcohol, multiple marriages, you name it. They're looking, looking, mm -hmm. looking, looking for something they never it. quite find. And it was there all along within arm's reach if right. they'd just taken the time to take God's prescription. And that's the sad thing is Satan has sold us a bill of goods. And uh, we should not be surprised that his method is still the same today, Mike, as it was in the Garden of Eden. That's right. If he can make something look good, right. make us think that it would taste good, but, and this would taste better than doing what God says, and it would make us look good, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. If he can get us to do all that, he's got us going right down the path to destruction. That's right. Well, he promises everything, delivers nothing yeah. other than heartache. You know, Solomon wrote many years ago, the way of the transgressor is hard. Sometimes people have to experience heartache before they realize, you know what, I really, really messed up. Right. BJ, you talk about drugs and alcohol and the fact that there are a lot of people that are consuming their lives 
in, in this way. It, it's amazing. They had something on television this past week about the number of young people that are addicted to chemical substances and different mm -hmm. things. And BJ, we, we have become a nation that, that has uh, just gone off the deep end when it comes to yeah. uh, alcohol, chemical substances. So how do we counter that and get people to see, look, happiness, satisfaction, contentment is not found in the bottom of an alcohol bottom, bottle. It's not found in a pill. It's not found in a needle. How, how do we get people to realize that? Well, we've that? been under this humanistic philosophy for decades now. And look at the fruits of it. Uh, you just mentioned it. I read in the paper or on the uh, internet the other day about a place in Ohio where the opiate addiction uh, you know, percentage is so high and there are so many young people dying there that the mortuaries cannot keep up, cannot keep up with the number of people and that the, uh, the coroner is sometimes absolutely out of space. I'm that. talking about out of space for to put any bodies anywhere because these people are dropping like flies and yet they're not flies. They're human beings who have worth and yet that worth has been sacrificed on the altar of do your own thing right. and find <clears throat> your own happiness. Now obviously these people aren't happy or they wouldn't be looking to a bottle That's or they right. wouldn't be looking to pills to find something. Uh, this is a heartbreaking situation if we can only get people to say, okay, wait a minute, let me try this instead of that. Because think about it, you, we've talked about marriage. You see this couple that's been married 57 years and they stand up and are recognized for their long standing marriage and people applaud that because it's rarer and rarer for that to happen. And yet look at them, contrast their happiness with the happiness of a lot of folks that are just basically in it for the short term. I think that there are so many people in our world today that have this innate void or vacuum in their lives. And as you, I think, said very well just a moment ago, they're looking for something. Yeah. They can't quite put their finger on it, but there's something they're looking for. And so they try this and this and this. They turn to alcohol, drugs, prescription drugs, and nothing ever really hits and and gives them the substance they're looking for, and so there's got to be something more. Solomon is exhibit A in how that doesn't work because he wrote an inspired diary called the book of Ecclesiastes, and in that book, Mike, he made it crystal clear that all the things he'd tried, the wine, the women, the wealth, the work, uh, you name it, all those things, the wisdom, the earthly wisdom, it was all emptiness, vanity, grasping for the wind. I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. Show us what you've got. Open my hand, there's nothing there. That's right. And Solomon says, I tried it all, and you know what? I hated life. Ecclesiastes 2.17, I hated life. That's sad. And uh, yet it's not because he lacked material things. It's not because he lacked women or you know wine or any of those things that a lot of people think, sure. oh, this would be the wonderful way to live and it's all glorified and we never get the memo it seems that hey this is a dead end street. Well and I think I think going back to what you mentioned a moment ago with regard to Hollywood, look at the number of quote unquote stars, people that have made it in the in, in, in the entertainment industry and, and, and the fact that uh, they commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Th their lives are consumed with drugs or alcohol. Why? Because they're unhappy. Because what, what they thought would bring them happiness right. didn't necessarily do that. Right. And so, BJ, in talking about the home, one of the things that has come to the fore in the last year, the Supreme Court's decision to legalize same-sex marriage in our country. And of course, same-sex marriage would be fornication, just like hetero, heterosexual sexual relations, homosexual sexual relations, they're both wrong. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of people today, even quote unquote religious people that are now saying, well, you know what? Uh, we need to recognize that marriage and we need to understand that this is their right, etc. How do we counter a culture? L let me just back up here, BJ. Does it seem odd to you that people in our country, when we talk about Bible, they're so biblically illiterate yeah. that they can't even give you a yes or no answer with regard to what biblically is 
right or wrong. Mm -hmm. Does that not just blow your mind? Uh, it does. As a matter of fact, I, I learned recently of someone who's married to a preacher but who is not, not sure about whether homosexuality is right or wrong. And how do you, how do you become a member of the church, a Christian, and go by the Bible and come to those conclusions? You cannot. Uh, that shows me one of two things is, is the case. Either the Bible is not known or it's known and not accepted. Sure. But this book right here, you know, which of the nine Supreme Court justices that we have in the United States of America, which of them created the universe and authored marriage? <laughs> None of them. And yet which of them has presumed to tell the one who did create the universe and author marriage that they know better than he does about what marriage ought to be. God. There's no a comparison. Those men have power that interestingly enough, Romans 13 said, the powers that be are ordained of God. That's right. Meaning that look, they would not even have the power that they possess if God had not ordained and created government. That's right. That's exactly right. And so how ironic is that? It, it, well, you're exactly right. B.J., uh, in, well, in, in, in contemplating this decision and the powers that be, legislation, et cetera, how many of those people do you think sat down and said, you know what, let's see what God has to Correct. say about the matter? Well, what right. about politicians in Washington? Don't you think it would be good to consult, okay, rather than sticking my hand up and seeing which way the wind's blowing, wouldn't it be good to just sit down and say, okay, Let's see what the Creator has to say about this. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, Moses wrote about a future king that would serve over Israel. He talked about some of the things that would, that would ultimately lead to his downfall. But one of the things that strikes me is that he was to take a copy of the law, write it down for himself, and then the Bible says, it shall be with him, verse 19, he shall read it all the days of his life. In a, in a, I think in a, in a very honest way, what president in, in the last half of, of our century has said, you know what, what's the Bible say about this? And for all the smoke and mirrors that we hear about separation of church and state and all the, the inaccurate uh, representation of that is concerned, if you go back and look at our early governors, our presidents, our founding fathers, those who were in Congress, they had a respect for the Bible. They may not have agreed on every single principle, right. but they had a general consensus. This book right here has the right answers. One of them, I believe George Washington said, it is impossible to govern rightly without the Bible. I was right. And so how do you get from all of those men who were quick to say, the Bible says, and now if a candidate running for office said, the Bible said, the media would mock him and sure. laugh at him and sneer and jeer and say, what, what are you bringing up that antiquated book? And yet they don't realize that this book is as fresh as tomorrow morning's newspaper. That's right. uh, it has all the answers in it. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away, Jesus said, Matthew 24, 35. And so we need to get people to have the same respect for the Bible that those early founding fathers had. Amen. I, I agree. You know, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, with regard to the king, he said, and the law, it shall be with him. He shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. And then why? Well, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or to the left, mm -hmm. that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. B.J., we talk about uh, ISIS, terrorism. You know, really and truly, when it's all said and done, I'll tell you who we ought to really worry about. Mm -hmm. It's what does God think? Well, that's right, because he has the ability to bring nations down. Jeremiah was told to go and preach in Jeremiah chapter 1, and God says, I'm the one that can plant nations or uproot them. That's right. And you go preach to the nations, and you tell them what I said. And uh, when nations don't listen, what happens to Sodom and Gomorrah and places like that? They go by the way, and we think, will they be the exception? Look, Rome was at the zenith and the pinnacle of world power. 
That's right. Every bit as much as America is or has ever been mm -hmm. in many ways. That's right. And yet, look, what happened to Rome? She fell. And Internally. Uh, it took a while, but it, it happened. Uh, you know, Rome fell in 476 A.D. in a major way. America has been in existence about uh, 200 years plus. And uh, you think about we don't have any promises from God that we're going to be the exception to the rule. That's right. Well, go back and look at Assyria, Babylon, Greece. You mentioned Rome. And, and you, you know, where, where are they today? Right. Dustbin of history. You know, somebody said on one occasion, when America ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Right. And there was a time when I think we could say America was great. And, and really, it is no uh, compliment to us that we have become so tolerant and so pluralistic in our thinking that anything and everything goes. The theme for the most recent election, you know, was make America great again. And in some ways, you know, I think that that is happening with Supreme Court justices being appointed that have some conservative uh, views on abortion and things of that nature. And so I'm not trying to, neither one of us are trying to paint a dismal picture that no good things are happening. Right. But here's the bottom line. If we really want to make America great again, it doesn't start in the White House. It starts in your house. That's right. It starts in my house. That's right. And we go house to house, getting every house to revere God, love His Word, live His Word, and America will be great again. Well, well said, well said. B.J., a minute and a half left. What would a person need to do to become a Christian to enjoy the peace that passes all understanding? Right. The Word of God says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And then once that Word is heard, what does it produce? It's supposed to produce faith, as we just noted, and because without faith it's impossible to please Him, please him Hebrews 11, 6. And then that faith is supposed to be so strong that it leads me to say, you know, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If I don't believe that, I'll die in my sins, right. John 8, 24 tells me. And then, you know, to repent. What would make me want to repent? Well, Romans 2, 4 says the goodness of God leads you to repentance. And so when I think about all men everywhere being commanded to repent, Acts 17, 30, the goodness of God makes me want to repent and then confess His sweet name unto salvation, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And then after doing that, to be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. To wash away my sins, Acts 22, 16. And then to live faithfully, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that my labor will not be in vain in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58. Well, and to know that when all is said and done, we have a home with the Lord forevermore. Yes. You know, Paul said, we live in hope of life eternal, which God who cannot lie promised before the world began. B.J., it's always so good to be with you. And thank you for being with us. We hope to see you right back here again next week. Until then, God bless. Then we shall rise on that resurrection morning when death's prison bars are broken. We shall rise. We shall rise. Thine the glory, revive us again.